Hey, uh, welcome to our annual uh, Constitution Day lecture. Constitution Day was the 17th, today is the 19th. But uh, Congress in its wisdom has said we only, we have to celebrate Constitution Day, but we don't have to do it on the day. I'm Dr. Knippenberg. Uh, and I have to begin by thanking the Jack Miller Center for generously funding uh, this program as it has also done in previous years. Uh, I guess we're doing something right because they keep giving us money. Uh, this year, we're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Jonathan Marks. Uh, and he is, to adapt the line from uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, the very modern model of a modern public intellectual. Too many syllables there, but, uh, you know, uh, and uh, so apologies also to Gilbert and Sullivan. And I mean that, that is public intellectual, in a good and indeed excellent way. He has first rate academic credentials, uh, three degrees from the University of Chicago, which, by the way, has an exceptional core curriculum and whose faculty, faculty recently adopted and embraced an exemplary uh, statement on freedom of expression. He has an impressive scholarly record, including a book on Rousseau published by Cambridge University Press, and a co-edited volume devoted to principle and prudence in Western political thought published by SUNY Press. His articles have appeared in major professional journals, including the American Political Science Review, which is peak professionalism, as far as we're concerned. Uh, his essays, not scholarly articles have appeared in the two leading higher ed trade publications, that is to say, Chronicle of Higher Education and Inside Higher Ed, as well as in the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, and uh, in Commentary. So far as I can tell, he hasn't yet made it into the New York Times, but recently that's probably not a bad thing, uh, nor the New York Review of Books, nor the Times Literary Supplement. So he's not yet quite at the top of public intellectual, but there's still time. Uh, now, his day job is as a professor of politics, and yes, they call it politics at her science college outside of Philadelphia. And it's a school that is, in some respects, like Oglethorpe. Uh, knowing that life, that is to say, the life of a prep professor at a school like Oglethorpe as well as I do, leaves me absolutely in awe of everything that uh, Dr. Marx manages to accomplish. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marx. Thank you for the introduction. I, I think I first met uh, Dr. Knippenberg some, some 20 years ago. We both looked great then. Um, I, was just, <laughs> I was just going out on the uh, job market, and uh, Dr. Knippenberg gave me some very good advice about uh, how to negotiate that. So that's one nice thing um, he did for me. And another nice thing is uh, being out here to um, give this talk. So. Um, thanks to uh, Dr. Knippenberg, to Oglethorpe, to the Jack Miller Center um, for making this possible. This talk is going to have three parts. Um, in the first, I'm going to ask, is there a free speech crisis on campus? Because one of the hard things about talking through this issue is that people don't really agree about the facts on the ground, about what's going on. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about that. In the second part, I'll argue that if there is a free speech issue, the First Amendment won't resolve it for us. And in the third, what I want to do is at least begin a consideration of how people get into a position to benefit from speech on campus. Because if people feel like they're benefiting from free speech on campus, it's more likely um, that they'll favor in some way um, free speech, though maybe not as a free speech um, absolutist or as a free speech warrior, but in some ways. That will be the third part. Um, first part's longest. So let's go to the first slide. March 10th, 2006. Um, some of you study con law may have already seen this case. Lance Corporal Matthew Snyder, who died in an accident while serving in Iraq, was laid to rest. Picketers from Westboro Baptist Church stood about 1,000 feet away. Um, and they held signs, some of them depicted on the slide. Um, some not depicted on the slide include a familiar anti-gay epithet. One depicted stick figures having anal sex. Other signs said, you're going to hell. God hates you. Thank God for 9-11. God hates the U.S. of A. The Westboro Baptist Church believes that God hates the United States for, among other things, tolerating homosexuality. A jury later awarded Matthew's father $10.9 million for infliction of emotional distress. Few, I think, deserve to break less 
than this Westboro crew. In 2011, they threatened to picket the funeral of a nine-year-old shooting victim. So these were not sympathetic um, plaintiffs, but the Supreme Court in Snyder v. Phelps said that the jury got it wrong. Westboro's words inflicted great pain, but they were displayed in a public place on a matter of public concern and therefore were entitled to the highest degree of First Amendment protection. In an eight to one decision, the liberal and conservative wings of the court agreed even fathers of fallen soldiers must tolerate hateful speech. Colleges and universities are often less demanding than that with respect to free speech. Kentucky State University's uh, conduct code includes embarrassment among punishable offenses against persons. Less striking, but still almost certainly beyond the scope of what the First Amendment would allow a public university to do, a certain private university considers, at least as, as I'm able to read the document, offense remarks, comments, jokes, slurs, or verbal conduct pertaining to an individual's personal characteristics or those of a group to violate its conduct code. I'm struggling to remember the name of this place, but give me the next slide. I think it might, we might get some hints on, on there. Um, now, that, that's on a cursory reading of Oglethorpe's conduct code. And there is at least one line in there um, which says that none of this is, you know, is supposed to um, affect the university commitment to free speech. But still, I'd say somebody reading this in a straightforward way would get the idea um, that making offensive remarks, however that might be defined, um, could get you in pretty hot water. Odd customs here, Oglethorpe University. <laughs> um, at the University of Wisconsin Superior, the newspaper's 2016 April Fool's issue included a couple of jokes that while offensive were A, plainly satire, and B, no more offensive than an average episode of the Big Bang Theory. Nonetheless, UW Superior's administration condemned the issue, affirmed that UW Superior will not tolerate any form of disrespect, and launched an investigation. So in that way, though not in all, and though it's not the only way, there's a disconnect between the world inside certain colleges and universities, which seek to protect students from offensive speech, and the world outside of those colleges and universities. Out there, judges tell people like Mr. Snyder, sorry, even hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. We sympathize, but the law can provide you no relief. Since at least 2015, when a protest at the University of Missouri started a wave of campus activism that's still rolling, many commentators have started to worry that not only college codes, but also college students are out of sync with the First Amendment. Often such commentators point to attempts to disinvite or disrupt speakers. For example, can I have the, the next slide? And those of you who follow this issue at all recognize this as sort of, you know, the snowflake argument. Something has changed about students, they, they, they just can't take it, and so they want to shut down uh, people who are speaking. This is from spring 2017. Um, Heather McDonald, a mainstream of short-elbowed conservative writer, was scheduled to give a talk at Claremont McKenna College, drawing on her book, The War on Cops. Student activists describing McDonald as a notorious white supremacist fascist, um, which I would submit she is not, organized to try to shut the lecture down. They blocked the entrance of the building in which McDonald was going to speak. In the end, McDonald did give her talk. There is another entrance, so she was able to um, give her talk. The talk was live streamed, but she gave it to an empty hall as protesters chanted and banged on the windows hoping that's not going to happen um, here today. Um, question and answer session was cut short, um, and she was hustled out of the room, through a kitchen, to a waiting unmarked van, right, and taken away as if she was, you know, a, a witness against the mob. Um, so that's, the, that's what happened um, at Claremont. Now, some people say that that was not a great anomaly. They say that attempts to disinvite speakers or to disrupt them while they're speaking, um, that those attempts are up. Can I get the next slide? So you can see in, in absolute terms, we're not dealing actually um, with all that many disruptions. There are over 4,500 colleges and universities in the United States. Um, and in the peak year, this is the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education that collects this information. 
In the peak year, um, they recorded 42 disrupts from disinvitation attempts, so that doesn't sound like a lot. Um, it's a funny slide, too. There is a big dip in 2018, and people start to say, well, see, you know, it's all over. But in 2019, we're working our way back up to sort of what the average has been um, for the past bunch of years. So in absolute terms, not a lot of these things, um, but in relative terms, they seem to be up. Um, does that matter? Um, well, some people argue, and I think there's something to this, that there's a kind of chilling effect. Um, so you don't need a lot of disinvitation to get people concerned about, you know, who am I going to um, invite, right, to campus. So, I mean, suppose um, uh, Dr. Knippenberg were thinking, I think I'm going to invite Barry Weiss um, of the New York Times um, over to give a talk. You know, she's a columnist from the New York Times, so that should be okay. And then somebody might say to him, but you know, Dr. Knippenberg, a lot of people really hate Barry Weiss. Even though she works in the New York Times, she's pretty controversial. Um, and maybe some people will show up to protest the event. Maybe we'll need extra security, and it'll be a lot of trouble. And Dr. Knippenberg might say, you're right. We need somebody bland, obscure, unknown, the kind of person who wouldn't provoke a protest. Maybe I'll call that short dude from her sinus. I don't remember what his name is, but I, I, I can look it up. Right, so I think I organize a lot of events, and this is always a consideration, right? It can't help but be a consideration because hiring extra security is expensive, and you want your event to go off without a hitch. So again, these are not a lot of disruptions, but right? I want to be clear about that, right? 42 in the peak year, so many universities. But the change in the number, right, over the course of time is an argument for there being a certain kind of chilling effect not just with speakers who nobody really mourns when they're not on campus, but with mainstream um, speakers who might have something useful to say to us and who might be able to advance our conversation. Worries about free speech on campus also point to, sorry, kids today, if I could get the next slide, majorities of whom, according to a 2017 Knight Foundation survey, think the colleges should be able to restrict at least some offensive speech. Not all, but I think this is slight. I can't really see it. That um, yeah, it may be the next one, but um, in, in this slide, I think it might be that that when it comes to political speech, they're actually not much in favor of um, of controlling it in one way or another. But they are in favor of controlling some forms of First Amendment uh, protected speech. Responded to that survey in relatively um, large numbers, including not only slurs, right, but but any language that's intentionally offensive to certain groups. Private colleges and universities aren't bound by the First Amendment, um, which does bind government actors, but at public universities, which are bound by the First Amendment, speech codes designed to restrict offensive speech, right, the kind of speech a majority of students here um, would like to be restricted, um, have routinely been stuck down, struck down in court, right, even if they're just looking to restrict hate speech. If you're a public university, you have to abide by the First Amendment, and for reasons connected with the Snyder v. Phelps, decision I started with and decisions before that. Um, state university is an arm of the state, right, have to accord speech, especially on matters of public concern, a high degree of protection. And so those codes get struck down. Um, what does that mean? It means that, you know, a lot of students, again, at least the ones surveyed here, would like to see certain kinds of speech restricted that the First Amendment protects, the judges um, wouldn't be willing to restrict a 2018 Knight Foundation survey found that 41% of student respondents, when told that the First Amendment protected hate speech, thought that it shouldn't. Um, that's less than the majority, but certainly more than a few. Um, the 2017 Cato Institute Free Speech and Tolerance Survey, can you get the next slide? Compares people now in college and graduate school to people who are not now in college or graduate school. And to discuss is not what universities should be able to do, but what the government should actually do. So this is a somewhat different um, issue. Here we mostly find students more willing to restrict, even outlaw, right? even outlaw speech than non-students are. They're more willing to outlaw public speech that's offensive to other people, whatever that means. That's, you know, that's a should, should not tie, 49 to 49. It's not even close in the non-college sample, who think 60 to 39, that government should stay the heck out of it. They're also more willing, can I get the next one? 
to restrict offensive or insulting public speech about immigrants, slightly more willing even to restrict offensive or insulting speech about Christians. The students and non-students are overwhelmingly against that. These data suggest that students are more likely than non-students to think that the government should restrict speech that the First Amendment protects. That the government should restrict speech that the First Amendment protects. So some observers look at this kind of data and they say, there's a free speech crisis on campus. Um, one of them is our president, who in March issued an executive order on the subject. He meant to send a clear message, I'm quoting him as he put it, to the professors and power structures trying to suppress dissent and keep young Americans from challenging rigid far left ideology. Colleges, on his estimation, are bastions, right, of such ideology, so students need to be protected somehow or another um, from that. Other observers think that our president and um, others who hold that view are wrong. So, as I was saying at the beginning, commentators differ just at the elementary level about what's going on. Can I get the next slide? Right. These are two headlines concerning um, free speech on campus, right? There's a crisis, there isn't a crisis. Um, so, is there or isn't there? Um, I lean towards saying there isn't a crisis, but I won't be arguing that there's nothing going on either, or that's a big hoax. If free speech on campus had a relationship status, it would be, it's complicated, and I'm going to explain why. First of all, right, contrary to a lot of um, the data we've just seen, student support for free speech in general remains quite high. Can I get the next slide? So the same Knight Foundation survey I mentioned in 2016 compared students 18 to 24 to a random sample of adults 18 or over. I know, and the Knight Foundation knows that students are adults. This is just a way of distinguishing a student sample that, that cuts off at the age of 24 um, from an adult general sample that doesn't cut off at the age of 24. So that's the distinction we're making here. One question the survey asks, and I'm simplifying it a little bit, is should colleges create an open learning environment where students are exposed to all types of speech and viewpoints, even if it means allowing offensive or biased speech? Or should colleges create a positive learning environment for all students by prohibiting certain biased or offensive speech? You would expect, based on the data that I just showed you, that probably most students would choose the positive learning environment, certainly more so than adults would, but that's not true, at least in this survey. Of the two samples, the one consisting only of students was more, not less likely, to choose an open environment. Um, as for the Cato survey, which we looked at, it finds a whopping 69% of students saying that freedom of speech ensures that the truth will ultimately win out. Think about that. That freedom of speech ensures the truth will ultimately win out. And I'm kind of a free speech guy, even I don't believe that. So I'd have to say that this level of support for um, and faith in free speech is quite high among students, right? If you look at this other set of data. Second of all, even on issues where students are most inclined to restrict speech, the attitudes of older and younger people may not be that different. And, and remember the thesis that I'm looking at here, right? That people are saying, well, students are complete snowflakes. They don't tolerate speech. Right? In order to test that kind of thesis, you have to ask, well, do students and non-students really differ that much? Um, on these questions. So let's consider yet another survey, um, the general social survey, which goes back quite a long way. Can I get the next slide, please? Um, so, so take a look at this, right? We're looking at a question, should a racist be allowed to teach? Um, and we've got data going back to the 70s here. And we got a lot of squiggly lines. If I had my cursor, I'd point to them. But you can kind of see at the beginning, right, that, that, that top line is young people, right, in the 70s, and the bottom line is people who are 65 or over, and they really diverge um, on this issue in the 70s, with, with young people actually much more inclined to say, yeah, let the racists speak, right? Um, but then as we kind of travel through time, you see the lines kind of, you know, they, they squiggle around a lot, and they come together, and they get teased apart, um, and by the um, 2018, right, that's the last year I have on these charts, people 65 plus, um, and uh, I think it's 18 to 24, 18 to 34, so it's not just students, but younger people, right? Um, they're about the same, um, with, with uh, seniors, I think, saying 40%, yes, let the racists speak, and uh, the younger people saying 42%, yes. I mean, that doesn't impress me very much, right? 
a 2% difference. So if, if students and young people were, were snowflakes, you'd expect a large difference. Instead, what this data shows you is that if there's a free speech crisis on campus because of this kind of thing, then there's probably also a free speech crisis in your local senior center, right? Because there's not that much difference, um, at least on some of these questions, between how people 65 or over answer them and how younger people um, answer them. Some of this data I'm drawing from the political scientist um, Jeffrey Adam Sachs, um, who's terrific on these issues. You could learn a lot more um, from about him by, by Googling him. Yes, I'd recommend that. Um, third and related. Attachment to free speech is uh, unreliable and sensitive to context. The Freedom Forum survey asks each year whether the First Amendment has gone too far. Right? It's gone too far. That's what they ask. And a certain number of people agree with that um, every year. If I can see the next slide. Now, granted, the First Amendment includes freedoms other than speech, but speech is the freedom people most recall in connection with the First Amendment. The survey deals with that as well, when they can recall any at all. In this year's survey, 40% couldn't name any um, of the freedoms protected by the First Amendment, but those who, who can name them, um, typically, uh, they recognize and remember speech first. It's kind of a proxy um, for whether people think there's too much freedom of speech in the country. You can see it's kind of all over the place, right? I mean, it's, it jumps around. There, there are real spikes. Um, sometimes the Freedom Forum survey tries to figure out why that is. So there are two big spikes gone too far, both having to do with terrorist attacks, right? 911 and then the um, um, attack in, in Boston. Um, so um, people say different things, right, in response to the same question, right, uh, during different years, depending on how they're thinking and feeling what environment they find themselves in. And so it's very difficult to say, well, group X thinks thing Y, right, about, about issue Z. And certainly free speech is one of them that seems to jump around quite a bit, depending on um, where you find yourself situated. That's the main takeaway, I think. Um, people will also have more or less support um, for free speech, depending on you know, who's doing the speaking and who's getting pissed on, right? That's a context that's important, too. Um, here's one more um, from Cato. Their adult sample is considerably more likely than their student sample, 59 to 41% to say they would favor a law against burning the flag, right? Um, so this group, generally speaking, says, no, don't ban this, no, don't ban that. But when it comes to the flag, they say, yeah, ban that. Yeah, can you get me the next slide, please? At the University of Kansas last year, some politicians, including Jeff Collier, the Republican government of the state at the time demanded that the university take down an art installation, which is what you're looking at here, um, depicting an altered American flag. The artist wanted, among other things, to illustrate the nation's dividedness. That's at least one of the messages um, of this installation. Um, the uh, university, right under pressure from the governor or other politicians, complied. They said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll take it down. Um, but they, they put it into an art installation. So you just made it, not an art installation, rather an art gallery. So they made it less public, though, right? They put it in a building so people couldn't see it. That, that wasn't enough, right, unless they happened to go to the museum to see it. That was enough for Governor Collier, right? He said, it's not appropriate to have a desecrated U.S. flag at a taxpayer-funded institution. Yet, since the 1989 Supreme Court case, Texas v. Johnson, it's been clear that even burning the flag, much less altering an image of a flag, is protected speech. Right? If there's a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, that's Justice Brennan, who wrote the majority opinion, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea offensive or disagreeable. We have not recognized an exception to this principle, even when our flag has been involved. So, although I don't think there's a free speech crisis on campus, I do think that many campuses find themselves under pressure Pressure from the inside, mainly from left liberal faculty and students, to suppress some kinds of speech, but then also from the outside, mainly from right conservative politicians, publications, and citizens, to suppress other kinds of speech. They find themselves in this kind of pincer move. And I'm not weighing one against the other and saying one's worse than the other or better than the other. I just note that if you're serious about the issue of free speech on campus, you really can't afford to ignore either one as commentators sometimes do, right? Some commentators care a lot um, about the threat coming from the left to speech, and some people care a lot about the threat coming from the right to free speech, but there aren't that many people who care about both. Um, there are some, right? But they're rarer than you might think. 
All right, one last survey, right? This is the last one. I don't usually get so survey happy. I'm a political theorist who reads old books, but you got you to follow the argument where it leads, I guess. Um, almost every survey I've looked at so far is iffy in one way or another. The general social survey actually samples very few college students, so it's not a great guide to what college students think. The Cato survey hasn't been run enough times, really, to give us much confidence um, in their findings. But there is a survey conducted by the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA. Do you guys administer that here? So maybe some of you have even taken it. It samples a lot of incoming college freshmen, over 137,000 in 2016. This dwarfs the sample size of these other surveys, which are often maybe 1,500, 2,000 people they're looking at. Um, it's been in business for more than 50 years. So you can actually look at some, some trend lines um, and see what's going on. Let's look at a couple of questions the survey has asked, unfortunately on and off um, for a good long time. One question asked to what extent students agree that colleges have the right to ban extreme speakers. Right? See, that's a proxy for attitudes towards speech more generally. Um, can I get the next slide? So, you know, as you can see, a, a lot of people kind of agreed with this, you know, for a while in the 60s it was pretty high, but then it leveled off in the 20s for, for quite a while, right, a good solid decade, and then um, they stopped asking, right, um, they stopped asking right around 1986, I want to say, um, and then they started asking in 2004, and suddenly the number was about twice as high, right, it made its way into the low 40s. Um, where it's remained ever since. There's a big jump. Right? Nobody really knows why, because th there's a big gap um, in the data. I like to think that somehow the very satisfying victory of the New York Mets in the 1986 World Series had something to do with this. Atlanta was in the basement that year, but you're having your revenge this year, right? Um, so, you know, maybe it was something political, um, maybe it was something not political, maybe, who, who knows, right? I, I mean, a lot of people like to say, that has to do with generational cohorts. You'll, you'll find some people saying, there's a book called The Coddling of the American Mind that makes this argument, a psychologist named Gene Quainview makes this argument, that we're basically looking at a kind of cohort shift, right? There are students who had different kinds of childhoods, grew up in different environments, um, coming to college, um, and that's changed their attitudes towards speech. But it actually doesn't fit this data set, because they're talking about iJack. Right, they say, well, it's iGen, but the iGen came to college in 2013. And what this data suggests is if there was a change, it occurred much earlier um, than that, right? At least the big change occurred much earlier than that. So, but one thing seems clear, right? Again, no free speech crisis, but it does look like maybe a free speech change, a change in attitudes, right, um, toward whether it's acceptable to ban extreme speech or not, whatever that might mean, right? Lots of people consider you know, things extreme that uh, other people would say aren't extreme at all. Um, can I get the, uh, the next slide? The survey also asked, um, unfortunately only starting in 1992, whether colleges should prohibit racist and sexist speech. From 1992 to 2005, agreement sits in the high 50s to low 60s, then they stop asking again. Um, in 2009, we've been in the high 60s ever since clearing 70% in 2015, the last year we've got data for, it's not as striking a leap as, as, as the previous one, but it is a bit of a jump um, in a relatively short period of time. All right, so, so here's my bottom line on what the evidence tells us, at least my reading of the evidence tells us about free speech on campus. First, student views of speech, free speech are complicated, right? You know this because you're students. Student views of free speech are complicated. It's probably safe to say that on average, right, if you take a large group of students and ask them, students are committed to free speech, you know, in the abstract. Um, they're prepared to limit in some cases, um, even speech the First Amendment would protect, right, if we were dealing with a First Amendment context, and uh, the degree to which they think colleges should impose such limits has increased considerably in the past 30 years or so. Um, so no free speech crisis, but a change in attitudes toward free speech, that's my bottom line. Um, finally, I think this is important, although students are not super reliable when it comes to free speech, neither is nearly anyone else, right? That, that's what kind of uh, puts the lie a bit to, to the snowflake characterization. Um, nobody's especially reliable um, on free speech, whether they're 18 to 34 um, or 65 plus. And that's one reason I want to argue that the First Amendment isn't enough, particularly when it comes to campus free speech. So that's my transition to the second part of this talk. 
Part two, the First Amendment isn't enough. Can I get one more slide? It's actually the last slide. Only the first part of the talk was really sliding. So the simplest reason um, that the First Amendment is not enough is that it doesn't apply to private colleges and universities, um, which aren't state actors. And, and why should it, right? The primary concern of the First Amendment is, after all, the overwhelming danger that the state, with its monopoly on the legitimate use of force, poses to freedom. Private colleges and universities don't have such a monopoly, so each private college or university gets to consider for itself, thinking about its mission, whether it's sensible to have as wide open a tolerance for controversial speech as the First Amendment demands of state actors. And it's not at all obvious that the answer is yes. Most colleges and universities, when they talk about their educational mission, say they want students to become more capable of judging and thinking well for themselves. And it wouldn't be a very good example of thinking well for oneself to say, well, if it's good enough for the state, the First Amendment, then let's apply it to us too. Right? You, you want to think it through, again, in connection with whatever the mission of your college or university happens to be. Even if we decide that private colleges and universities should adopt First Amendment values voluntarily, still no self-respecting college or university, right? Again, we take pride kind of, right, in thinking for ourselves, would assume that the court's present interpretation. You know, maybe a century old, if you count dissents, is the right one. Um, nor should we assume what the majority of the court has said relatively recently about the First Amendment is the right way of thinking about it. I mean, maybe Justice Alito was right, right? He was the one in that 8 1 decision, Snyder v. Phelps. So, you know, maybe he was correct when he said that in order to have a society in which public issues can be openly and vigorously debated, it's not necessary to allow the brutalization of innocent victims like Matthew Snyder's father. So again, we don't have to, right, if we're at a private university, right, listen to what the Supreme Court says, even if we think that the First Amendment is really important. Our interpretation of what the First Amendment and the values that it embodies, uh, what the implications are, could be different from what the Supreme Court says. So no, we can't just fall back. Um, on the First Amendment, we have instead still to consider this question. And I'll limit myself to thinking of colleges and universities as educational communities, even though you know, some of them do a lot of research, too. If you want to cultivate the judgment of students, right, that's the question. If you want to cultivate the judgment of students, how should you regulate speech, if at all? That's the question I want to consider. Now, those who want to claim the widest latitude for free speech on campus usually fall back on the work of John Stuart Mill, the author of the 1859 work on liberty. Many of you come across that work in your travels? All right, so, so not a majority, but uh, enough. So in On Liberty, um, Mill, kind of like a university, is more concerned um, with the pursuit of the truth and the cultivation of judgment than with beating back the coercive power of the state. Right? So sort of funnily, he thinks that the time for that threat is past when he writes this in 1859. So he's, he's more concerned about more subtle threats um, to freedom, threats they might pose to um, societal progress. And on this basis, he makes an argument in favor of free speech that looks like a good fit for universities. The argument, I'm going to simplify it dramatically, um, looks like this. One, human beings are really, really, really bad judges. Right? Probably there's no one in this room that's going to disagree with that, right? Um, really bad judges. Um, in particular, we're one-sided beings, he says, I'm quoting him, natural partisans who grab onto one part of the truth and mistake it for the whole thing. And that's just kind of the way we are, says Mill. Two, the only thing that saves us, even if we're really clever, is that we're capable of correcting ourselves. And three, our one-sidedness can be corrected only by exposure to every variety of opinion and way of looking at no wise man, Bill says, ever acquired wisdom in any mode than this. Right? So if you're sort of limited right, to a partisan view that comes naturally to you, you really need to be exposed right, to other points of view in order to have a chance of correcting yourself and getting a better grip. Um, we're getting close to having a grip on the whole of the truth about something. So whether you're a society looking to make progress or a university looking for an atmosphere in which judgment can be cultivated, you want to make sure, this is Mill's argument, that every variety of opinion is available. Even if its availability means only that we're kept on our toes and better understand the opinions we hold. So 
So that's maybe the leading argument for a free speech on campus that equals or surpasses free speech off campus. But I actually don't think it's an adequate argument, and, and let me explain why. If we adopt Mill's position, right, the university becomes kind of, at least outside of the classroom, kind of like a public park. And that may sound like an exaggeration, but think about an argument you hear you know, pretty often. One demand people make when, when someone wants to bring a partisan speaker onto campus is, um, we need balance, you know? So if you're bringing in a Republican, bring in a Democrat. Right? Put them on a panel together, bring in the Democrat later, but let's have balance. If you're bringing in a liberal, bring in a conservative too. Right? That's often the argument people will make. They're very concerned about imbalance, um, and they imagine that somehow, out of the clash of partisan opinions, right, if we just hear both, we'll be able to arrive at the truth. So that's how it's going to work. And again, that's like a public park, right? You've got Team Deplorable, they're handing out pamphlets in one corner. You've got Team Hashtag Resistance, they're handing out their pamphlets elsewhere. We'll read them all and figure it out somehow or another. Truth Mill puts to himself is a question of the reconciling and, and combining of opposites. But even Mill doesn't really think it works quite this way. Um, he anticipates that when you open up the discussion, right, in other words, when you throw people into a situation in which there are all these partisan opinions being shouted out, and people consequently learn what other people think, they'll tend often to become more rather than less one-sided. Right? Anyone who spent a moment on Twitter will recognize <laughs> this phenomenon. Uh, Mill says, um, I acknowledge the tendency of all opinions to become sectarian, right, more partisan, is not cured by the freest discussion, but it is often exacerbated or heightened thereby, right? Um, when I didn't know about the other opinion, I could kind of ignore it. But now I reject it all the more violently because, you know, there's a face on it. It's being proclaimed by people I regard as opponents who are bad people and trolls, right? Why does Mo think this is okay? Because it doesn't sound okay, does it? <laughs> Um, why does Mill think it's okay? Well, he says, you know, it's not on the impassioned partisan, actually. It's on the calmer and more disinterested bystander that the, that the collision of opinion works its salutary effect. Right? So, so not on the people who are shouting at each other who are participating in partisanship, but in some disinterested or more disinterested and calmer bystander. Now, think about how this works in practice, right? He seems to be saying, sure, you know, I know. You invite in a pro-Trump speaker, an anti-Trump speaker. You know, we're all, most of us, going to have more froth coming out of our mouths than we did before. And that's almost going to be the only result. We'll just hate each other more than we did yesterday. Right? But he says, you know, that's sort of okay because um, people like Professor Knippenberg, disinterested, calm, right, can sit back with a clipboard and watch us yelling and throwing things at each other and say, indeed, this is quite interesting. Right? And can we agree that that's probably not a viable educational model? Might be good for Professor Knippenberg, but it doesn't sound like a viable educational model to me. At the very least, we need to be confident that colleges and universities know how to shape the kinds of calmer and more disinterested bystanders Mill has in mind, right? Um, can most people on campus become like that? Is that something you can do? Now, the loud arguments we have about free speech on campus strangely avoid the question of how to get students in a good position to judge speech. If they talk about education at all, it's either to suggest that it happens automatically when students are escorted into the presence of screaming partisans, to exaggerate a little bit, or they say, let's just teach them the First Amendment more. Right? And as I've already said, right, the First Amendment is not enough for a variety of reasons. Um, so that's a deficiency, right? In a way, a lot of the arguments about free speech on campus people have aren't about education um, at all. About how, to educate people, about how to educate people who have some interest in and capacity to judge right, what they're hearing. Right? Listening that way, almost nothing is said in these debates. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, but even if we decide, right? Yes, let, let free speech ring, right, on campus and from sea to shining sea throughout the country, et cetera, et cetera. Anyone who's serious about education has to ask um, this question. How do you create conditions in which people could benefit um, from free speech? So that's, that's part three.
free speech is an acquired taste. Let me begin by saying that I think students who are skeptical of the value of absolute free speech often have very good reasons for being skeptical about the value of absolute free speech. I'm just going to name one, although there's more than one. The examples of speech we encounter are on average pretty uninspiring. Right? So whether you're watching some hired gun operating on TV um, or reading blowhards operating on Twitter, I'm at Mark's J01, by the way. Um, I expect to see my follower count increase by about 30 after this. Um, you can easily get the impression that what speech is is basically it's a means of trying to get the better of other people, right? Of exercising power in some manner or another. Um, more of aggrandizing yourself, right? Of making yourself look good, right? Um, so sometimes in class, right, you know, people will talk a lot. Uh, maybe they can squeeze a good participation grade out of their professor, right? Uh, not Professor Knippenberg. He has he a good eye for that kind of thing. Can't, can't think your way through that. But, um, you know, so some students are, are highly skilled. Some, some non-students also highly skilled, right, at, at being glib and talking a good game. And they don't care about the truth, right? And somehow or another is speaking in order to get the better of other people or to puff themselves up. And I would say that covers a lot of speech we hear. I don't know if it's most, but certainly a lot. And maybe most of public speech. Um, that we're exposed to. So why would you think, gee, free speech is really great? Why wouldn't you think instead, you know, it might be nice if some of these people, some of the time, in some circumstances, just a little could be made to shut the hell up? <laughs> right? I, and that strikes me as quite a natural, ordinary, sensible reaction. I mean, the other sounds much less natural, right? I mean, why would you not impose restrictions, right, on this kind of thing? Um, insofar as it looks kind of worthless in some manner or another. Now, we might be able to convince such people not to shut other people up by appealing to standard arguments that I find pretty persuasive in favor of free speech. We might tell them, for example, that attempts to shut down bad speech often go wrong. We might tell them that hate speech law and codes are often turned against the very people they're supposed to protect. We might be able to convince them that the best remedy for bad speech is more speech to counteract it. But the problem with those responses is they stay within the terms which have nothing to do with education that I've already described. It merely says to people who are already partisans of some kind or another that the best way of getting your pre-existing point of view to prevail is to allow free speech. So even at this level, speech remains a means of advancing your own opinion somehow or another or your interest um, and not a mode of inquiring into the truth in some way or another. If people including students, but not just students, are actually to learn something when they find themselves looking at a variety of opinions, they have to be convinced there's some kind of speech other than the kind that's an instrument for getting the better of others or of puffing oneself up. They have to experience the kind of speech by means of which people who share an interest in the truth and a willingness to live according to what they see of it, what they can see of it, can test and learn from each other. Now this sounds hokey. Probably, but we do have a model for it, right? The scientific community. In a scientific community, members, however competitive and ambitious they might be, right? They may very much be looking to get the better of other people and to, you know, find out the great discovery first and become famous and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, right? They're expected. They sort of agree to a set of norms and rules, right? According to which um, they will submit their view, right, to the scrutiny of others. Right? And they'll abide by that scrutiny. In other words, if it turns out that the evidence and arguments are against their position, then they'll abandon the position. Right? At least that's what's expected. That's what the norm is. Um, so they're united in the pursuit of a common good. Right? They may have other desires and wishes. Right? They may be very ambitious, but they're united in the pursuit of a common good so that when one of them makes a discovery, it doesn't take away from the good of the other person who hasn't made it. Right? It enhances everybody's good. Um, within the community, right? How can we learn the truth about nature? How can we produce the best working model um, of nature that's available? Um, they become proud, you might say, right? People educated in science become proud of pursuing the truth via experiment. Certainly, many of my undergraduates in the sciences, advanced undergraduates, have this pride. And therefore, of the readiness to live with the ground shifting underneath their feet, right? So there is such a thing as a scientific community. Um, it breaks down partisan and international barriers. So barriers usually uh, divide people. 
persuades them they have some kind of common good to pursue together, um, and gives them a kind of set of norms to abide by as they pursue that good, right? Um, so that sounds pretty good. Now, not so hokey that there might be a kind of speech, right, of, of the sort that involves inquiring of the pursuit of the truth um, in the name of the common good. But it's a lot easier for them to communicate in the sciences, I think, because the standards for judging arguments are reasonably clear and widely shared. It's more difficult to form a wider intellectual community because there we're looking to make progress, but in areas where standards are not so clear or as widely shared. Right? We look to make progress also in areas where, as in politics, questions are often surrounded by, as the first of the Federalist Papers puts in a torrent of angry and malignant passions. So that's kind of the argument, that's kind of the environment we're living in, I'd say, when we're taking a politics class or something like that. The standards for distinguishing between bad and good arguments aren't super clear, but I'd submit they are there, uh, but not as clear as they might be in mathematics or science. And also, um, there are subjects about which people become quite impassioned. It becomes much harder to abide by common standards or have the idea that you're pursuing um, a common good. But forming such an intellectual community, that is that wider intellectual community I'm talking about, even if it's realized very imperfectly, which I think it always is, and initiating students into such a community, that may be the most important work of a college or university. Um, certainly it's among the most important works of a college or university, at least if it has the educational goal I have suggested cultivating the judgment of students. Now that task is hopeless, of course, if communication can't help us improve our understandings. Right? There has to be a form of communication. It's not just about getting the better of others or puffing yourself up. Now, to repeat, Mill concedes that only a certain kind of observer, the calmer and more disinterested bystander, usually benefits from looking at a collision of opinions. So universities should attempt to shape their students, not just a couple of them, Right, or a few professors, but all their students to be something like Mill's calmer and more disinterested bystander. They should attempt to initiate students into an intellectual community, which in principle can test opinions so that it's possible to distinguish between sages and frauds. What's a member of this intellectual community like? Well, the calmer and more disinterested spectator doesn't need to be entirely calm, nor does she need to be entirely disinterested. When we enter into an intellectual community, we don't forego all aims apart from the pursuit of the truth. We may want to cure cancer, right? That's okay. Uh, we may want to make peace. We may want to improve the economy. But we agree to hold ourselves, at least while participating in this community, above the fray in the following limited way. We agree that in conflicts between our personal convictions and the best arguments and evidence, the best arguments and evidence must prevail. Right, that's our norm. So we're not passionless. We go into this community, maybe with all kinds of priorities, um, but we adopt a norm according to which what we're going to do is follow the arguments and evidence where the argument and evidence leads. We've decided that that's the best means of pursuing our goals, and so we're willing to submit to those norms. John Locke, how many of you read John Locke? Yeah, a few more, actually. So in some thoughts concerning ed education, he says, that there's nothing so misbecoming anyone who pretends to be a rational creature as not to yield to plain reason the conviction of clear arguments. Right, that may not sound like much, right, who doesn't yield to plain reason the conviction of clear arguments, but you know, what we're really hearing is, is sort of what we mean um, when we say we want somebody to be reasonable. Right? When we say you want somebody to be reasonable, we're not saying, you know, you really need to take informal logic again and figure out the rules of induction and deduction, right? We mean some, somebody teaching such a course. It's still a good course to take, right? But um, usually when we're sort of shouting be reasonable at somebody, it's funny we shout it quite often, it's very frustrating, so we don't sound very reasonable, though. When we shout be reasonable to somebody, we're kind of grabbing about the lapels and saying, you know, for heaven's sake, stop trying to win, stop trying to show off, you know, stop being a shill, stop playing around, and let's try to examine the arguments and evidence as if it really mattered, right, what the truth of the matter is. That's sort of what we mean when we say be reasonable to somebody. And I'm suggesting that that's what John Locke means in his quotation. Um, and this, this is a reasonable goal um, for colleges and universities. Um, now, will the person who's reasonable be a free speech absolutist? 
see my, I'm still going through puberty, that's why my voice changed like that. Um, or a free speech warrior? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, it, it, it's not clear, but I do think um, that such a person, you know, what we call the marketplace of ideas, is likely to be a smart shopper, um, and she's also likely to have a motive um, for listening as carefully as possible um, to the arguments and evidence, and consequently is most likely to value being in the presence of people who disagree with her and allowing that person's view um, to be heard. Um, so I, I think it's, as I've, I've just said, one of the most important aims, right, of a college university to shape reasonable people and to offer a compelling portrait of a community um, in which reason rules in this limited sense that I've described. Now, let's take this back to the question of free speech on campus. I've argued today that a university or a college, at least if it isn't governed by the First Amendment, has to decide to what extent tolerating extreme, offensive, controversial, or just very stupid speech fits its mission. I've noted that the main argument free speech advocates have adopted is John Stuart Mills. For one side of beings like us to develop independent judgment, we have to be exposed to every variety of opinion and way of looking at things or to clashing opinions. I've argued that in Mill's own estimate, that works only for a certain kind of bystander. So the First Amendment isn't enough. Colleges and universities need to shape that certain kind of bystander. How might this influence the way in which a college or university thinks about ongoing controversies about free speech on campus? In particular, right, the one I started with, what do you do about speakers who are perceived as extreme or offensive? How should we look at that? Our discussion can't end, as I think it often does, at whether a speaker has or doesn't have the right to be on campus, right, with a question of rights, or even whether a speaker, whether people have a right to hear the speaker, um, still at the level of rights. Um, if we're serious about the mission of cultivating judgment, we can't stop there. Uh, we can agree that promoting reflection, on deba reflection and debate on campus is an important means of achieving the mission, but we should also acknowledge that a campus at which multiple views are just shouted out is not necessarily a thoughtful campus. So if you see a campus in which you've got right-wing speakers speaking, you've got left-wing speakers speaking, that's not necessarily a sign of a healthy campus. Um, two modest conclusions about this. First, we ought to try to sponsor speakers who, whatever they argue, argue as members of an intellectual community. Prepare to follow the arguments and evidence where they lead and to test their claims and have them tested. Right, against other arguments and evidence, rather than dodging them. Right? So somebody who's willing to look at the strongest arguments against uh, her own position is the kind of speaker um, that you might want present. But we might determine, we often do, that there's a lot to be learned from a speaker whose primary goal is advocacy. That's fine, too. There's nothing wrong with inviting a partisan member of Congress to give a talk. You might learn a lot from listening to such a person, or uh, a member of uh, a non-governmental organization with a cause, right, who's trying to convince you of something. Uh, but the key thing is, if we think that we can learn something from a politician or anyone whose primary goal is advocacy, we should try to ensure, whether by sponsoring post-event discussions or by having a respondent or by preparing our students to engage thoughtfully with the speaker, maybe by having them read something in advance of the event, that the aim of the event, even if it's not the aim of the speaker, that the aim of the event becomes reflection rather than conversion. Because the speaker wants to convert you, right? She's an advocate. Um, but that's not our goal, uh, to present people to be converted, um, to speakers who wish to convert them. Many people who are engaged in the debate about free speech on campus, whether they sincerely believe there should be free speech throughout a liberal society, or they're just looking for one more weapon with which to bash universities over the head with, too often stop short of whether speaker X or Y has a right to be on campus. That is, they stop short of the question of how speakers do or don't serve a college or university's educational mission. But no one who's serious about education can afford to stop there. So, so let's not stop there. Let's keep going for at least a while um, with Q and A. Thank you. Um, you briefly mentioned Twitter. Do you think these large social media corporations should abide by the First Amendment, Amendment or do you think they have a right as their own corporation to monitor themselves and project whatever they want to? Well, I think they have a right. Yeah, so, so, so th that's the answer to the second part of your question. Um, 
You know, it always depends on what, what, what they're trying to be, right? So there are some corporations that take a, a strong interest in innovation, for example, like a company like Google. Um, and you might expect them, kind of like, um, you know, scientific labs are sitting in a university, um, to strongly value free expression. So they might have First Amendment-like norms, right? They might find that valuable to do. And if you look at the range, you might kind of, again, grab them by the lapels and say, well, your norms are this, so why are you restricting speech so much? Right, so the question is really what kind of a thing Facebook wants to be. Yeah, so if it just sort of wants to be a place where um, people feel relatively comfortable, then I think, you know, it's fine for them not to have First Amendment-like norms. If they consider themselves a service that's looking to educate people, they might come a little closer to First Amendment-like norms. Though, of course, in the classroom, you don't divide by First Amendment-like norms simply anyway, right? So. That's not a, a, a firm answer to your question. It depends on what kind of corporation Facebook is looking to be, right? Um, and if they're not going to be that way, then, then other um, companies uh, need to spring up to compete with them on that level. So I mean, if you prefer a social media site that, um, that doesn't uh, take down posts that other people complain about, then um, you know, you're free to join such a site, and I think that's, that's fine. I'm going to wait any other student. I don't know. Um, what do you believe caused the increase in extreme speakers between 1985 and 2005? Do you mean um, the increase in extreme speakers, the increase in people willing to say that a university can ban extreme speech? Yes, the second. Okay, yes. So the short answer is I don't know. Um, but I, I want to give a, a somewhat longer answer, at least give you an idea of the kinds of things people say about this. Um, not all of them all that convincing. So, um, and, and you'd actually have to try to map these phenomena onto the timing of the change. And that's something I haven't tried to do, which is why I don't have a clear answer. So for some people want to argue that some, some kind of cohort effect, right? It's generational change. Um, so people born starting on a certain date, somewhat arbitrarily cut off, you know, your generation X, your generation Z, your millennials don't want to leave them out. Um, your attitudes toward politics, toward speech, those things might, might change. So some people like to talk about covert effects, at least most of the arguments I've heard about those effects don't actually map on to when this change is taking place. So that's, I, I'm not convinced by those arguments, so I think there, there may be some other kind of argument along those lines that might succeed. Um, some people argue that um, it has something to do with the growing diversity um, of colleges and universities, which creates some friction, right? Um, when you get together people with different experiences and opinions, which is something you very much want to do on campus. Um, but once you have that kind of, um, that kind of diversity, um, there's likely to be more, more tension um, as a result of it. And um, people don't want that tension to be stoked up more and so have more tendency to say, let's kind of calm things down and you know, not have that speaker speak. Right? It also might tend to increase partisanship for roughly the reason you know, Mill described. So internally on campus, you have more diversity, you become actually aware of these people who have different views than you, you can really become very angry. Right? Um, and so you, you might want to shut down the other side's speech. Um, some people finally, I'm not sure if I'm covering all of the ground, but a third argument is that people um, say it's not really a campus phenomenon, it's more of a national phenomenon. Um, and so they tie either to growing political polarization, or some political scientists won't really tell you that there's, there's so much political polarization, so much as the people on different sides hate each other. It's a little bit different, right? In other words, your, your views can sort of fit you know, a, a, you know, in different spaces on a curve, right? They won't be super polarized that way, but nonetheless, people who sit on different sides and different parties might hate each other more. Um, so if it's the case of either polarization um, or this tendency to despise our political opponents has increased um, over the course of time, and maybe was increasing around then sometime, um, then you might expect greater partisanship and anger um, and a greater willingness to say, yeah, let's, let's shut that down um, if we can. I'm sorry, one more, because I don't want to suck all the air out of the room, but um, some people would argue that there's less resistance to shutting that, that, that kind of speech um, on campus because there's been some change in the diversity um, of faculty, different kind of diversity, namely um, uh, political diversity. So um, faculty have always been predominantly liberal, um, left liberal, I should say. Um, they're more so now than they used to be, right? That's been um, a growing trend. I think, I think nowadays, even if you pull together all the people who identify as conservatives on campus, all the people who identify as far right, there are very few of those, um, all of the moderates, 
right? All of those people, they're still vastly outnumbered um, by people who consider themselves in the far left um, and liberals. So the argument goes sort of like this, that there's just not much pushback. Right, coming from a faculty, or for that matter, from administrators, who if you believe the political scientist um, Sam Abrams, at least the student-facing administrators, are, are, are more predominantly left liberal than the faculty. So there's not much pushback then um, coming at least from some campuses against people who wish to ban extreme speakers. It becomes a lot easier to do. Right? When are you most likely to think that you can ban speech? Right? Sort of when you can get away with it. Right, so people off campus, right, if, if they think, well, well, Trump's in charge now, so I can ban liberal speech, right, you'll, you tend to think, well, I can do that now. If on campus, right, left liberals think, well, we've got some power <coughs> here, they're going to be more tempted to say, well, let's shut down speech out of mind. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, what if you could draw a distinction between can and should? I, I can have Nazis come to campus and speak under the guise of the First Amendment. But I probably shouldn't. So I like what you said about um, when you invite a speaker to campus, they should be part of an intellectual community. Um, because I don't really think people learn a lot from people who go to either extreme, and I don't think a lot of camp. So I, you know, as an administrator, I used to be a free speech supporter in all cases, and now I'm not. But I would also draw the distinction between speakers, which get the headlines, and then you put up our, um, that was very clever of you to put up our, um, our community statement. Because I think it's different when a speaker comes and says something to students speaking to other students about what can be said and what can't be said. Yeah, well I think those are two important distinctions to make. Um, and let me say one about each. Um, so first distinction, should you invite um, you know, a Nazi onto your campus, or um, should you invite a member of the alt-right um, onto campus, or should you invite a Stalinist onto campus right, to go to the um, other side of things? Um, so there is what goes on in the classroom and what goes on in a relatively controlled environment, right? Um, you bring speakers in. Um, well, let me put it this way. Right? So, certainly, in, 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 you know, if you're a state university you know, and you have a um, procedure whereby you allow students to invite um, uh, speakers in, this is where you get most of the speakers that you were describing, right? Student groups, mainly in order to challenge right, uh, the limits of free speech, will invite these speakers in. Um, so, I think the problem, right? So, if you're a state university, basically, you can't say, I'm going to let students invite these speakers and say, except for you and that speaker. Um, I think there's an argument for private universities abiding to something like that rule. In other words, if you're going to let student groups do it, you probably shouldn't practice um, viewpoint discrimination uh, when you're doing it. Um, I do think that if these groups who want to invite people and have faculty advisors, right, um, faculty advisors probably should discourage them and say, well, why don't you bring in this person who, you know, uh, maybe makes an argument coming from your side of the political aisle, but isn't trying to take advantage of our college and university, right? These people are sort of barnstorming the country, right, to get behind podiums at prestigious universities and say, my speech is being suppressed, right? You don't really want, want people like that um, on campus, not so much because of the point of view they're expressing, but of what, what they're trying to accomplish um, at the university. I'm um, sure so speakers like that. So again, if I'm a faculty advisor, um, I urge against it, and I, generally speaking, try to set up on my campus an atmosphere in which, generally speaking, people won't want to go see such a speaker. They just won't be interested. Um, Anthony Cromwell wrote a, um, a book that just came out, what's it called? Something about American excellence. He's a former dean of Yale College. Um, and he takes the free speech discussion sort of to that level. He says, you know, that the key is not so much um, getting into viewpoint discrimination issues where sort of administrators then sort of have the power to say this is okay, that's not okay um, with respect to speech. Um, instead, what a college university needs to do is create a kind of environment, you might say, in which people are going to be more inclined to invite speakers who contribute to the intellectual community. That's sort of a happy side effect of creating an intellectual community. You still might get extreme speakers because being extreme, whatever that means, Right, it's hard to define, isn't it? But being extreme doesn't necessarily mean can't make a contribution right, to an intellectual discussion. 
Um, so that, that, that's the first thing. And then the second thing, yes. So there's a difference between what goes on you know, in the classroom, what goes on in dormitories, what goes on in the space between those areas. Um, I think it's very tricky, and I actually think that people who write about this subject um, haven't done enough to explain, in a way, why we should have an untrammeled zone of free speech right, on campuses. So um, there's a book called Free Speech on, on Campus, which I think is very good, by Erwin Chemerinsky and Howard Gilman, uh, who are both law professors. It's a book that I'd recommend. It's very good, but one place I think they fall a little bit flat as they just say, well, this is kind of just the way things have evolved. You know, there's a free speech movement in Berkeley, and now we kind of think it's great to have lots of free speech on campus. But that's not necessarily such a thoughtful way to approach it. So you have to consider, I think, um, a couple of things. Again, the issue of what you want to give administrators the power to do or not do. Right, that, that's a kind of inside the university version right, of the First Amendment argument, you basically say, well, I don't want to give some administrator, no offense, I love administrators, right, but um, some administrator the, the ability to decide, well, I think this is extreme and I think that's not extreme, right? Um, so you get into to, to that concern, right, when, when, when you're dealing with that area, even, even inside, right, the doors, what's allowed, what's, what, what's not allowed, what, what can I hang up, what can't I hang up, um, that kind of thing. Um, but, I'll just say one more thing about this, because again, I don't want to suck all the air out of the room, but I think it's a really interesting question. Um, there are two cases that can be made for fairly serious um, restrictions on what people say, especially right, um, in dormitories, and uh, they have somewhat different ramifications, right? One you can make is basically, look, there's a difference between, and the First, first Amendment, uh, or at least our interpretation of the First Amendment recognizes this too, right? There's a difference between posting something on somebody's front door and making an argument a public park, right? So a dormitory might have a special status. You might have general uh, rules that don't discriminate between viewpoints. Just say, well, you, you can't hang something on somebody else's door. You can't slide something under somebody else's door because that's their home. You know, so that, that, that's one argument. Um, a second argument you can make is we're always saying, I, I, I'll bet you guys are too, we always say there's are sinus that the dorms are somehow or another an extension um, of the educational offering elsewhere. So if things don't stop in the classroom, you're also being educated in the dorms. And I would say then the question becomes, all right, well, we know we don't want the dorms to be like a classroom, right, that's going too far, um, but are the dorms and spaces off campus somehow in between, right, the controlled environment of the campus and kind of free for all that you get in the public park? And I, I think that's something that, that is at least worth, worth discussing further, let's put it that way. Three. Quick points. Um, first of all, I take a little bit of issue about um, private universities' ability to uh, act as sanctuaries. Um, we're, we're going to dissolve this Cal Calhounian uh, nullification. We'll have a little fight from here, a little fight from there. Each of these schools takes federal money, and therefore they should be um, subject to federal regulations and laws, including the uh, Bill of Rights. So I'm not quite sure if speech zones truly should be allowed on private or um, non-private universities, certainly not on public universities, but on private universities, because unless you do like Hillsdale and just say, no money, thank yous, we don't want any, you, you should be subject to the laws. We're not, we're not setting up separate entities. We are part of one big community with laws. Second thing is, um, about free speech, the concept of local parenti. When I was in college, because administrators were my parents. Yeah. You know, uh, when my son went to college, what, 15, 20 years ago, um, I couldn't call and ask the health service for his medical records. And then you saw the idiocy of Yale, of all places, where uh, the president of the house goes, um, um, you can wear what you want on Halloween, and the kids are screaming, you're supposed to protect us, you're supposed to protect us. And, and so it puts the administration in a very awkward position. You know, um, same thing happened at Harvard with uh, Professor Sullivan being one of the lawyers for Harvey Weinstein and the lawyer, the legal students saying, we don't feel safe with you being on campus here. So you, you can't have it both ways. You can't be an independent acting like an adult and the college not being local friend and then saying, we need safe space, we need safe space. I think we need to come to some sort of 
understanding of what the role of, is, of, a, of a campus as far as safety goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, just just a couple of couple quick things about I that. that. One okay, yeah, go ahead. I'll try to keep there, it all in my there, head. There, there's, there's, there's all sort of related. You sort of answered it. Um, I don't think the John Mills Market, by the way, the speech is excellent. The John Mills Marketplace is a nice theoretical thing, but it really doesn't exist here because he started alluding to it, but the numbers are far unbelievable. 90% of uh, faculty in the social sciences identify as either Democrats, progressives, or liberals. Less than 5% identify themselves as conservatives or Republicans. Money donations are about 99% to one. Mm -hmm. um, and diversity seems to only um, pertain to uh, race, gender, and sexual pro proclivities. No one talks about ideological diversity or religious diversity or military diversity. I mean, how many colleges teach a military history yeah, in the United but, States? But, but, or let, let, let me see if I can, I, I think I understood the question. So let me see if I can t let me try to go backward and see if I remember them all. Um, so um, concerning uh, political diversity, well, actually, let me start with actually um, yeah, military diversity. There, there I'd say, in fact, and if you look at the way rules concerning you know, harassment and speech are drawn up, they generally speaking do include veteran status, right? In other words, veterans are, are a protected group, um, according to the way I've seen most of those rules um, drawn up. So they're not per se neglected. Um, I would recommend, if you haven't read it already, on, on this intellectual diversity um, score, um, a book called um, Passing on the Right, which was written by um, two political scientists, um, one by the name of um, Josh Dunn, and I'm going to forget the name um, of the other guy. Um, and what they do is they try to understand um, you know, what the situation is like for conservatives at the university. Um, and they kind of begin with the problem you're describing, right? Assuming it's a problem, right? That, that um, yeah, as you say, right? I, I gave you the general numbers, but in some areas, you know, some subfields and fields of the humanities and social sciences, there's even a wider disparity. Um, so, you know, what does that mean in terms of what gets taught? And we're all aware, right, we're prejudiced, and we can all do the best we can to overcome those prejudices. I don't really remember, but students on surveys have said 80% of conservative students feel suppressed in class to write a paper on what they really want to because they're scared the professor will punish them. Well, that, that number sounds actually too high for me. So, so I, I'd look at the, uh, the Foundation of Individual Rights on Education and the Heterodox Academy both did surveys on, on this matter. I'm on them both. Okay, yeah, well, I, I don't think it's 80%, but it is much higher for conservative students than it is for um, uh, liberal students and somewhat higher than it is for moderate students. And he's describing the phenomenon of um, self-censorship, right, that um, conservatives are more inclined to um, censor themselves um, on campus, uh, at least as they report on surveys, and conservatively more so, um, as you say, than um, the liberal or moderate students. Um, but anyway, so, so passing on the right, um, you know, they in a way distinguish between and they're interested in intellectual diversity, but they, they, they do note um, that some conservatives cut, cut their teeth right on professors who may identify as liberal, um, but still teach material straight. So they, they tell a story, you tell a thousand of them, of a professor um, with sympathies toward you know, Karl Marx, who said, look, I'm gonna teach you um, the book. Um, I disagree with most in the world. Friedrich Hayek's Road to Serfdom. Um, and I'm going to ask you to um, make the best argument for it that you possibly can, the most sympathetic argument that you possibly can. And I will say, having been you know, in the higher ed business for, for a while, I, I think a lot of my colleagues follow that professional norm, more or less. I mean, they do the best they can. Um, they may not be able to get, you know, it's hard to get beyond your prejudice, so I'm not saying it's not a problem, um, that there's a lopsidedness. Um, but I just hesitate to, um, draw the, the straight conclusion from there's an imbalance to um, that means um, that you can't have something like the million approach going on. I'll, I'll bet that professor converted more than one student to a Friedrich Hayek, albeit perhaps by accident. By accident. Um, on the Yale um, question, this is a direct answer to your question, but I, I would just, and again, I, I think you can tell from what I've said that I, I'm in general in sympathy with the argument, but. I, I want to be careful about um, drawing strong conclusions from these really high-profile cases. Because, you know, in the higher education news, it's like all other news. When it bleeds, it bleeds. 
You know, so um, Larry Summers was president of Harvard, you know, and uh, he certainly had an experience that might have led him to say, right, um, colleges have gone insane. But in fact, he says, he does an interview with um, Bill Crystal, conversations with Bill Crystal, the podcast. He says, you know, and what's mostly going on is what's always going on. You know, teachers teach, students learn, they make friends, they have an education, they get a degree. And if you think that mostly what's going on is what you're reading the news, these shark attack stories, that's probably not right. Again, I'm not saying they're not significant. I think they are significant. I'm just trying to suggest that, 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 that one doesn't want to home in too much because you know, the, the nature of the coverage dictates that you know, when, I, when I teach a good class, right, there's not a headline in the New York Times. Marx teaches a great class, very balanced. Right? But if, if, there, if there's some kind of um, uh, you know, altercation, then, then that gets wide coverage. Um, finally, I'd say that you know, I, I, you know, Professor Knippenberg can speak to this better than I do, but I don't think that the, um, that, that the fact that the federal government funds higher education means that they can set any conditions that they want. In fact, that's an argument um, um, that's made about Constitution Day. The Constitution Day is, is, it, is an unconstitutional imposition um, actually on college universities because it's coerced speech through participating in active coerced <laughs> speech, right? Um, so the argument goes. So I wouldn't go too far in that direction, but I will say that there are some states that have taken, or at least one state, I should say, that's taken this line. California has. California has said um, that its private universities must abide by the same regulations um, as, its private, as, its private, as its public universities do. Um, and so if one wanted to get action on that, it, it, you might have better luck at the state level um, than you would at the, um, at the federal level. Thank you. Any last questions? One more question, and that's it. I just wanted to know if you had done any like research specifically on the tolerance of students to hear like speech from people who may not necessarily like align with their values at like a religiously affiliated and non-affiliated institutions. Actually, I haven't, but um, I will say this. Um, so I mentioned the Higher Education Research Institute survey. Um, they, they do break that down, um, so you can see what the students surveyed. Um, at religious institutions think. I'd also add that I've heard, that I, I, I guess I don't know if it's true, um, but I, I, I've heard that um, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education actually tends to undercount instances of, um, not, not, not you know, purposely, but just because you know, these incidents are, are reported, and they tend to undercount um, instances of um, you know, disinvitations and attempts to um, interrupt speakers at, at religiously affiliated institutions. So I think there's work there to be done. It's worth doing. Maybe somebody has already done it, but if not, you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.